Business Breakdowns is sponsored by Tegas. We created Business Breakdowns to uncover the lessons and frameworks behind every business, and that's what makes Tegas our perfect launch partner. Much of the foundational prep for these episodes gets started with research powered by Tegas. With Tegas, you can learn about any public or private company directly from former execs, customers, and industry experts, all of whom are in a position to offer unique insights into a company's growth, its customer value, and its competition. What makes Tegas different is that you don't have to lead your own expert calls. It offers instant access to the world's largest collection of investor-led call transcripts on companies like Coinbase, Hinge Health, and Farfetch. All you have to do is log in and you'll get instant access. Still want to do your own expert calls? Tegas also allows you access to experts for $300 a call, not the $1,000 or more that others charge. I can personally say that some of the most thoughtful investors in the world use Tegas and talk about it often. If you're ready to go deeper on any company and you appreciate the value of primary research, head to tegas.co slash breakdowns for a free trial. That's tegas.co slash breakdowns. This episode is brought to you by MIT Investment Management Company, also known as Matimco. As the endowment office of MIT, Matimco searches for investment firms that are focused on achieving exceptional long-term investment returns. Matimco's goal is to create long-term relationships. They will partner with firms as early as day one and do not ask for general partner economics in return. Visit Matimco's website to learn more about their unconventional emerging manager approach, including examples of managers they have backed. While they only partner with a handful of new firms each year, they have also created and published resources for the broader universe of emerging managers to benefit from, making them even more unusual in the LP world. Matimco also opportunistically hires new members for their investment team. The Matimco team spends their time learning about great businesses and investments, working with exceptional investors around the world in order to support generations of MIT innovators. Visit matimco.org, M-I-T-I-M-C-O.org to learn more. Click join to learn more about the global investor role on Matimco's team and click emerging managers to learn more about their emerging manager activities. This is Business Breakdowns. Business Breakdowns is a series of conversations with investors and operators diving deep into a single business. For each business, we explore its history, its business model, its competitive advantages, and what makes it tick. We believe every business has lessons and secrets that investors and operators can learn from, and we are here to bring them to you. To find more episodes of Breakdowns, check out joincolossus.com. All opinions expressed by hosts and podcast guests are solely their own opinions. Hosts and podcast guests may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Before we dive into business breakdowns today, I want to highlight a new show that we're launching this Friday, Web3 Breakdowns. Web3 Breakdowns is a series of conversations exploring innovation in the decentralized internet. Each episode will focus on a different topic. We'll cover NFT projects, crypto assets, blockchain-based protocols, and businesses being built with Web3 architecture. We will talk to founders, artists, investors, and influencers to understand this emerging ecosystem. Come join us down the rabbit hole, coming to your podcast player of choice this Friday. Today, we're breaking down HelloFresh. HelloFresh delivers weekly meal kits to people's homes. With 8 million active customers, the Berlin-based business is the most popular company of its kind in the world. To break down HelloFresh, I'm joined by its CEO and co-founder, Dominic Richter. We discuss the challenges of scaling an operationally intense business, why HelloFresh is more like CPG companies than grocery stores, and what he's learned about brand building. Meal kits are a notoriously difficult business model to get right, and this is a great example of process power, a competitive advantage you don't come across often. Please enjoy this great breakdown of HelloFresh. So, Dominic, to begin our conversation on HelloFresh, I think it's important for those that haven't used the service for you just to describe the state of the business today. So maybe you can open by telling us what your business does and who the customers are and who you reach and work with. So at HelloFresh, we're really focused on dinner and on home-cooked dinners. It's a huge category and really a category that hasn't seen a lot of innovation over the last couple of decades. So when we started the business 11 years ago, we said there is such a big amount of money that is being spent on home-cooked dinners, but people still go once or twice per week to the grocery store and actually then 
buy inventory, use that inventory over the course of the week, and then do the same grocery shop again. And there was this funny statistic that we that came across, which is the average family cooks the same seven meals over and over again. So very little variety. And that's really what we're tackling with HelloFresh. As of today, we're in 15 markets globally. Our product is that you become a member to HelloFresh. We then push our menu of 30 to 40 weekly meals to your phone, to your desktop, and you choose how many meals you want. Is it two meals, three meals, four meals, which household size, which delivery day? And then from then on, we go out, we source all the products, we manufacture the products, and we actually get it all delivered in a box right to your doorstep so that everything that's left to you is really cooking a delicious meal in 30 to 40 minutes. And more recently, we've also expanded into ready-to-eat meals. So not only meals that you cook from scratch, but also meals where you actually just spend a couple of minutes putting them in the oven. How many meals are delivered per year across those 15 markets? Just like the headline number seems like it would be fascinating. And and maybe a stat or two about just the scope of the business. Like how many people do you work with? Just some high-level numbers. Last year, we delivered around 600 million meals globally. We're on track to beat the 900 million meals this year. So that's really like a big, big scale. And at the same time, that obviously means that we have to build up like a pretty big organization. So globally, we have about 16,000 employees working at HelloFresh, around 4,000 in corporate roles, of which more than 1,000 in technology roles, the rest across marketing, culinary, menu planning, operations, finance, HR, and about 12,000 people that work in our logistics and fulfillment roles. They work in about 25 manufacturing sites and 12 corporate offices all around the world, from Sydney to New York to Berlin to Amsterdam and London. As a business, we did about 3.8 billion euros in revenue last year, more than 10% EBITDA and free cash flow margin last year. Like I said, we're not only going to grow our meals by about 50% year over year, but also our revenues. Maybe you could pick one of the meals and just describe the experience from the customer's standpoint end to end. You push me the menu, I pick, you tell me which meal it is, and then just describe literally like the packaging, the process, like what is the full customer experience with one meal as an example? You'll get the order delivered right to your doorstep. You unpack the delivery that you get. We have different meal kits in there. And in such a meal kit, if we pick a recipe, for example, chicken parmigiano, you'll tend to find a chicken breast. You'll tend to find the cheese rightly measured to the gram that you actually need to cook that meal. You'll get the beans on the side. You get the potatoes. You get the tomato sauce. You get everything pre-measured so that really in line with the instructions on the recipe cards that we deliver, it's very, very easy to follow this step-by-step guide and put a great meal on the table within 30 minutes. The amazing thing, I'm sure, and we'll talk about this in detail, is the operational complexity of being able to deliver this experience at the end. Sounds like a pretty simple thing to understand. It's the right portion. I get a card. I cook the thing as you described and I eat it. But behind that, I'm sure it's just like an incredible amount of detail, especially at the scale of 20 million people eating this food. So maybe it's a good excuse to go back to the simplest version of the story when you started the company, what the original, original service was and how important it was to start in like a geographic density, for example, because it seems like if it's food and it spoils and timing matters and all these things are important, I'd love to just hear like the original origin story of the first product that you built and why, like what the insight was that really worked for the consumer back in 2011. So one of the key insights that we had was that grocery shopping hasn't changed and that people cook the same meals over and over again, and that there are a lot of leftovers. And so we tried to put together elements from different business models that we've found all across the world and came up with our first product, which truth be told is actually quite different from what we do today. So back then we thought it's important that it's on demand. It's important that the meals rotate on a daily or on a weekly basis. Those were some of the things that we had as basically pre-notions and then actually were proven wrong very, very early on. I think the interesting thing to understand is that once we had found product market fit, we were still starting with a very, very narrow proposition. So after a couple of months, we basically had three meals per week. 
we got you one delivery day per week. And it was either you liked those meals or you didn't like those meals. And so what we then did over time as we scaled internationally, as we gained scale in all of those markets, is to broaden the appeal to more and more customer groups. So as of today, you have 30 to 40 meals on the menu. We went down in pricing by about 30% from when we started. And we also deliver on seven days per week in different time windows. And that's really a little bit the secret sauce and how we've thought about scaling our business. How can we make the customer proposition better and better so that it becomes more and more relevant to all the different customer segments out there? Maybe you can talk just a bit about how the business works from a P&L standpoint. So a typical order, starting with revenue at the top, you mentioned the total revenues, but if you just walk through the sort of right way for people out there to think about the P&L and the major cost centers and, and how you get to that 10% EBITDA free cash flow margin, just give us a step-by-step -step breakdown of how that works. When a customer places an order, he has the opportunity to choose two meals, three meals, basically however many meals they actually want. In the end, that works out to an order of about $50 or $60. And that revenue number is then in the end, obviously driven by the number of orders and of the price per order. Now, for every order that we have and that we fulfill, we also have certain costs associated with it and directly attributable to it. Most importantly, we have our raw material costs, our food costs, which are about 35% of revenues. And then we also have our fulfillment costs, which is the labor and our manufacturing sites, packaging, shipping, depreciation, rents, the salaries of management of those sites. And those also come out to about 35% of revenues. So in the end, on every single order that we ship out, we clip a contribution margin of roughly 30%. And I'm saying roughly 30% because we have some markets that are more mature where it's much more than 30%. And then there are others where it's way less than 30%. But 30% is a good ballpark number to understand the breakdown of the business. And then those 30% contribution margin really allow us to cover our sales, marketing, and our general administrative costs and turn a profit. So most lately, we've been spending then around 15% of our revenues actually on marketing to new customers and getting in new customers to drive further growth. And we've spent about 5% on GNA. So GNA mostly consists of the management team, the engineering teams, finance, HR, corporate offices. But we've seen great operating leverage given the scale of the business that we have right now. And that's about 5% of the business. So really from the 30% contribution margin, minus 15% for marketing and 5% for GNA gets you to roughly the 10% FDA margin. Now, what's interesting is really that it's in the end, it's a portfolio of markets. It's a weighted average of all of the 15 markets that we have. And there are some markets that are 10 years old. And then there are other markets that are two years old. What I just told you was ballpark the breakdown of our PL as it stands today. But in the end, the way to imagine is that as we mature our customer base, we need to spend less and less on marketing to actually drive order growth. And the longer we are on the market and the more scale we have, the higher our contribution on each order gets because we just had more time to pick the right suppliers to optimize our supply chain. We get better pricing from our suppliers. And so in the long run, I think that we can actually significantly increase from the 10% EBITDA margin that we have today. I think at this point, it's then obviously the question, how much of that additional margin do we want to capture? How much of it do we want to pass on to consumers? But I think there's a lot of runway for us to improve not only top line revenue over the next couple of years, and I think we're going to talk about growth strategy later, but also over time to actually get to even higher profitability levels. Can you walk us through the manufacturing plants or factories or whatever you call them? Like, How many are there? What does one look like? Are they all kind of the same? Do you sort of stamp them out? Should we think about this like Amazon's warehouse network or something? What is the right way to visualize and think about these centralized places that sound like a key part of the process? So at the moment, across the 15 markets that we operate in, we have around about 25 of those manufacturing facilities. As of now, we have a pretty good blueprint and idea how we want to build them from scratch, if we build them from scratch. But given that we've only been 
10 years on the market and have been scaling rapidly over the last couple of years. There are also like a big portion of those fulfillment centers or manufacturing centers that are not 100% according to that blueprint because you've already put down money, you've already put machinery in, you've already fitted those sites out and obviously want to amortize that and depreciate that over time. So I think we by now have a pretty clear target architecture, but not every single center in our network actually follows that target architecture already. The way to think about it is really like a manufacturing site. It starts with inbounding. So orders are scheduled to come in and basically five to 10 minute slots are getting quality checks are then being put in inventory from inventory, some of it goes straight to the assembly line. Other things go first into our value add space within our manufacturing sites where we mix together different ingredients, marinate meats or mix sauces or spice mixes, and then basically put that back into inventory and then from inventory onto the assembly line. It's semi-automated, so still a large part manual, but also quite a bit of technology that we actually use there to make sure we can pick as efficiently, as productively as possible and actually assemble all of the different ingredients and meal kits into the right order. All goes at the end of the assembly line into a huge sortation network where we then basically pick and pack the different boxes and orders onto pallets and then give those pallets out either to third-party delivery companies or to our own delivery fleet. So we operate both a third-party network and we also in a lot of geographies, have started building out our own first party delivery network. There's something completely fascinating to me about which recipes are right for the business and for consumers. And it seems like there needs to be a balance between something that works for HelloFresh, the business, and something that delights consumers that they want to eat over and over again. So talk to me about how, if there's 30 to 40 choices, talk to me about how something gets into that top 30 or 40? Like what are the attributes of a productive, good meal recipe for HelloFresh that fits both the consumer and the business? So our menu changes basically every week. We have a good portion of repeats within those 30 to 40 meals, but you would hardly find the same meal in the same months or something like that. A good framework to think about those 30 to 40 meals is We think of it as our catalog, the way that Netflix thinks about their content catalog or Spotify thinks about their content catalog. That's the same type of framework that we actually apply to our menu. And we think about all of the different custom segments that we have, the type of preference that they have. And then we try to actually, with a lot of constraints imposed on menu planners and menu planning algorithms to come up with a menu that meets constraints in terms of cost, in terms of repetition rates, in terms of innovation, in terms of a lot of different preferences that customers have stated so that you, Patrick, and I, who might be eating a very different diet, can still always find enough great meals on the menu that we will actually place an order. It's a very data-driven process. And in the early days, it was one chef standing in the kitchen and thinking about the menu for the next week. But these days, it's actually like a very large data-driven and very often programmatic approach to menu planning that we have so that we can make sure we satisfy as many different preferences and customer lifestyles and diets as possible. Yeah, I want to come back to the data part because I think there's obviously a growing advantage that you have with more and more customers and more and more ingredients that you can use to improve the business. But first, I'd love to understand, again, on the recipes, I'll never forget talking to one of these breakdown hosts, Zach Foss, about how Domino's is such an interesting business because the cost of the ingredients is so low relative to like a Burger King or something. So the higher gross margin allows them to invest more in things like a delivery network, et cetera. The cost of the ingredients really impacts the business tremendously. How do you think about that? Like, I assume that you want to be able to provide someone both steak and pasta, but that steak and pasta have, you know, a very different cost of ingredient profile. So how do you think about that? Like, how does that impact the service, the business, et cetera? This is one of the constraints that we actually put on the menu. We tend to have a pretty good idea what type of meals different customer groups like. And we have a pretty high accuracy in actually predicting what you, Patrick, will place as an order next week, which type of meals would be appealing to you or not that we can actually use to balance that out. There are some customers that always go for the steak 
There are other customers that more go for the pasta or for a vegetarian dish, which obviously have different costs of goods sold or different input costs. But in the end, we right now try to not optimize on a recipe level, but more on a menu level, because very often a customer that takes steak on one day will take pasta on the next day. And we want to make it as easy as possible for them and give them a very broad choice because we have found that this actually increases average order value, this increases order rates in the long term, and it also very much increases customer satisfaction, so that we're not overly concerned if there is a number of meals on the menu that have a higher price point than others on the menu, because given the curve where we have great accuracy in forecasting as to which meals which customers will actually pick, we can use that as a balancing mechanism to not overshoot on the cost side when it comes to putting great meals on the menu. Obviously, then the supply chain becomes really, really important. And I think one of the most interesting things in our research about the business is how the HelloFresh supply chain looks very different from, let's say, a traditional like grocery supply chain. Maybe you could actually start with the contrast. What is the world that you came to look like in terms of supply chain from producer of the food, whether it's a farmer or a livestock producer or whatever it might be, through to the meal? Just describe side by side the differences, because that seems like an absolute key part of the business and kind of the innovation. Let's start with the menu. So let's assume we have 40 meals on the menu. Then most of those meals have about 10 ingredients each. So that means that in any given week, we're actually looking to procure around 400 individual SKUs, 400 individual ingredients. And there are some that are getting used in more than one meal. So in reality, it's more like 300 ingredients that we need to procure per week. So an assortment of 300 ingredients versus a typical grocery store that has 50,000 plus SKUs obviously then also requires a very different procurement process. So our procurement process needs to be very agile. We need to have a lot of suppliers onboarded and audited that are in our supplier pool and that then are some of the best in the world in actually delivering at very high quantities the type of ingredients that we need in one week, but are also okay with us not placing an order in the next week. So if you think about those 300 ingredients, then there will be some where we have annual contracts because we know potatoes are going to be in the menu each and every week for the next year. Pasta is in some way or form on the menu, on each menu over the next year. But using something more exotic like a pineapple, we probably use that once every two or three months. So we still have suppliers in our supplier pool that are audited where we can place orders, but we use them at very infrequent steps or very infrequent times. It's really about that narrow range of SKUs that we have that then determines the whole procurement process, which is just entirely different to the procurement process, which needs to be super standardized for someone who has a million different SKUs like an Amazon or a grocer who has 50,000 SKUs typically on offer for customers to choose from. When you then think about the manufacturing, it's the same thing. We don't really put anything on inventory and draw that down for the next month or the next six weeks. We actually have a lot of things that we use on the same day that it's inbounded into our manufacturing sites. It's being used it's being packed, sealed, and then shipped out to the consumer. So it's a lot less about inventory. It's a lot more about just-in-time manufacturing and really figuring out those principles of lean manufacturing, of being agile, of continuous improvement, of making sure that you can be as productive per square feet as possible in those sheds that you have built out and automate. I have to imagine that this has huge implications for wastage, food waste, just generally speaking, like you're going to be about as efficient on not wasting food as possible in this kind of lean, just in time manufacturing style. Whereas I don't know the stat, but I'm sure there's a ton of food that gets wasted in a traditional grocery store supply chain or value chain. Do you have stats around that? Or is there a good way to describe the magnitude of that impact given how you do it versus how say a grocery store operates? This is actually one of the big advantages that we have, both financially, as well as from an ESG perspective. A lot of different stats out there, but 
One that I like to quote is, I think, from the United Nations, that in the U.S., it's more than 30% of perishables that actually get produced, harvested, but never end up in a consumer's home or never get actually consumed. And that is obviously huge because everything that you buy at a grocery store, you also need to pay for all the stuff that actually goes to waste, either in the supply chain, because supply chains are typically quite lengthy, with a lot of handovers, where at each step you have different waste ratios. And then also, nobody wants to buy the last apple in the shelf. Nobody wants to buy the last tomato. So you always need to have that minimum stock, etc. And that just means that there is such a huge deal, like about one third of all perishables that get produced, but never consumed. And in our supply chain, given that it's a very demand-driven supply chain, a pull supply chain rather than a push supply chain, we have a very accurate idea about how much we're actually going to sell to our customers. And that means that we can very accurately predict demand, only order what we actually need. And so we operate along our supply chain with waste ratios of under 1%. And so that's obviously a huge difference, both financially as well as from an ESG perspective. And I'm sure that the gross margin difference is just insane and drastic between a grocery store. I think grocery stores operate at like seven to 20% gross margins. And you already talked about food costs being 35. So you're at a 65, just like pure cost of goods, gross margin. There's a huge, huge difference. What does that most unlock for you as a business, that difference between a grocer's gross margin and yours, to say nothing of the wastage, which is obviously a huge improvement, ESG wise and just generally speaking. So I feel that the comparison to grocery stores is actually not even the right one. It makes much more sense to compare to CPG companies, because if you think about that, they also source raw materials, they inbound that into their manufacturing sites, they manufacture a product, and then rather than delivering that product direct to consumer, they usually split the gross profit that they have with the retailer who clips half of that and they clip about half of that. Now we clip all of that, but then we also have to acquire customers and we also have to ship it directly to the consumer. But nonetheless, I think at scale, and if we were only to grow at the same rate like some of the big CPG companies grow, which I hope is many, many, many years away, then I think our margin structure would actually be quite similar to those larger CPG companies. Grocers just have a like completely different value chain, given the network of stores, given the value at work, given that they need to split the margin with a manufacturer. I think it's just in many, many ways, not comparable and not really the right peer to look at to really understand margin structure and value drivers in the business. If we take that lens on it, then we have to talk about the customer and understand how historically you've acquired customers. How do you think about paying to get them, having it be product-led growth so that friends are telling their friends and there's organic growth? Talk to me about the whole picture of identifying who the right customer is, how you acquire them, and how you think about things like churn. Like I imagine if you think about Blue Apron or something famously, the churn in that business was horrible. I think ultimately is the sort of death knell of the business comparison a lot of listeners will make as to something like a Blue Apron. So talk about the differences there and just generally how you think about customer acquisition and retention. So all of our customer acquisition costs are obviously upfront, and then we amortize them over the first couple of orders. But even before we actually make that sale, make that first conversion into someone becoming a paying member, we usually have had multiple touch points with consumers before. There are a lot of touch points that we can actually track on digital advertising. We're spending big on uh, paid social, on Google, on linear and programmatic TV, on direct mail and many, many other channels, podcasting, etc. But I think the framework to apply is that it usually takes consumers between five and 10 touch points with a brand to actually make a purchase decision. To push people over that barrier to actually make that purchase, very often you incentivize that, which is making a really good offer. And especially in an order renewal model like ours, where you amortize your advertising costs over the first couple of orders, it really makes sense to incentivize people to try it out and to basically have the experience for themselves of cooking the meals, if they like the meals, if this is a relevant product for them. When we think about advertising, we think a lot about how can we make sense of all of the touch points, both online and offline, 
upper funnel and lower funnel that we can have. And we have built our own marketing tooling suite over the last couple of years, which I think is actually like a big part of our success. We've always had the philosophy of building a lot of things in-house to collect a lot of data and combine a lot of data in-house that just allows us to make better decisions and to justify spend in certain advertising categories where you wouldn't be able to justify it if you just looked at it on a channel-by-channel -channel view or on a very siloed view. I think this is really has been one of the strengths of our business that very early on in the business we said, this is so important for making a consumer brand widely known and to generate great brand awareness to really make sense about how many impressions do we need to have? How many touch points do we need to have with a consumer before she converts? And that's why we've been building that out. And that's how we've been able to really see that relationship around higher brand awareness and then having to spend less on customer acquisition. Because in the end, what brand awareness just is, it's all of the money that you spent on past impressions on that customer, on making your brand available before that customer actually converts. How do you explain the fact that there's been many well-funded competitors or people doing some sort of meal kidding that have just gone so badly from a business perspective well, it seems like you're thriving a lot more. Like, I'm curious what your retention is of a customer. And like, once you have a customer, kind of what the life cycle looks like from that point forward. So it'd be great to hear that. But why does that seem so different? How do you explain that difference versus some of the others? Yeah, let's uh, first talk about that because it's obviously like a question that we get a lot. One of my favorite stories is of VCs in the early days that said like, oh, wow, you got to 1 million run rates in uh, six months. That's great. But how many people are out there that actually like want to cook dinner at home? Isn't everyone stopping cooking dinner at home like soon? And then a year later, you go to them and say like, hey, we're now doing 25 million in revenue run rate. And they're like, oh, wow, I never thought you're going to get there. But can you get to 50 million? I don't think so. <laughs> and uh, now we're on like uh, 6 billion run rates. And I still hear a lot of people actually saying like, hey, how many people are actually eating dinner at home, etc. But that's the market that we're going after, right? And to think about churn and repeat with the auto renewal plans that we have, we're really in the middle between classic subscription business and we have some element of a subscription business and we have a lot of elements and probably the majority of elements of our business model is like a classic e-commerce direct to consumer brand. If you think about retailers, they usually have low customer acquisition costs. They're usually profitable on the first order, but they also have very infrequent purchases. And if someone hasn't bought last week, but you will still think that he might be buying in six months time or in 12 months time, if you've actually provided value to them. For a subscription business, very often you have this automatic billing cycle you have high upfront customer acquisition costs. And if somebody actually at some point stops using that service, that usually means they're churned and they're not coming back. And so if we translate these two worlds into, into our business model, then we see just very different customer behavior from different people. We have a business model, dinner, eating dinner at home or cooking dinner at home that happens basically every single week which is why very early on at HelloFresh, we have figured out that setting it up as an order renewal plan makes most sense for consumers that want to get it a lot and also makes sense for a lot of others because we give them the ability to manage those plans as flexibly as possible and we don't really have a lock-in effect. And so that means that there is very different customer behavior. There are some customers that try it out, that start using it religiously every week and cook three meals per week for a very long time. And those customers exist. But then there are other customers that place an order, that use it for two, three weeks, that pause it for a number of weeks, use it again for two, three weeks, pause it for six months, use it when the kids go back to school or when they're back from Christmas holidays or something like that, and use it much more infrequently, much more like you would use another direct-to-consumer brand. And so if you compare us to the two other extremes, to a SaaS model, we obviously don't have negative churn and net dollar retention of 120% plus or something, some of these numbers. That's not the model that we have. But compared to SaaS businesses, we have way lower barriers to entry. If someone has not ordered for a couple of months, there's still a very high likelihood that they're eventually order again if they were happy. And compared to retailers, 
we just, or other direct to consumer brands, we just tend to see like a much higher order frequency through those order renewal plans that we allow customers to treat as flexible as possible. If you look at credit card data, if you look at a lot of other sources, which we obviously do as running our business diligently, then you can see that compared to other direct to consumer brands, which is recovering our upfront customer acquisition cost much, much quicker. So can recycle that cash much more often than they can. We get more orders out of a certain customer cohort, and we tend to have much, much better revenue retention over one year, two years, three years, than almost all other direct-to-consumer brands or retailers out there, but obviously not at the level like a SaaS business or a subscription business because we don't have that lock-in effect. And there are a lot of customers that stop ordering with us for a number of months or a number of quarters, but then eventually come back if we have new meals on the menu, new service levels, a better product, and that's really the way to think about it. And of course, there are customers that just try it out once or twice and actually say, I don't like your meals or it's too expensive. And I'm going to go back to cooking dinner the way that I did it the last 10 or 20 years. How do you think about, and sorry to harp on a competitor, but it's just fascinating. Like, why did Blue Apron fail? Like, what did they do wrong or have they done wrong relative to you? You know, you're 10 times their size now in terms of just like revenue. What about the customer experience allowed for the success that you've had when from the cheap seats as someone that isn't deep in this industry, it seems like a somewhat similar offering, but the results have been drastically different. So appreciating the very unique in-between business model that you've just described, why have you won relative to peers that do something the most similar? It's very hard to get all the insights of what a competitor did or didn't do. So I don't want to go too deep on that, but more generally, I think our business model is incredibly complex. You need to be world-class in engineering. You need to be world-class in procurement. You need to be world-class in fulfillment. You need to be world-class in building a brand. You need to be world-class in obviously having the greatest meals possible in front of a customer. So we often use that tagline, you need to be a world-class athlete. And if you only like pull one of your muscles, you can't compete on the highest level. And so I don't actually know what the muscle was that some of our competitors have maybe pulled or that they haven't developed as much in tune with the other muscles that they had. But I think for us, we've always been thinking about that. We need to develop all of the muscles in tune. And if just one of them fails or is not performing to the high standards that it requires for that type of complex business model that we have, then it's just going to be very, very hard to build a world-class business. So that's the one point. And the other point is once you have an advantage, and then can use that advantage and have it compound over many, many years, then you just end up with vastly different outcomes. So I wouldn't say that there is anything that we are 10x better than any of our competitors, but we're maybe 2% better in this, and we're maybe 5% better in customer acquisition, and we get an additional order out of each customer, and we've been earlier to actually go direct to the source and procuring our goods and enhancing margin. And then if you look at the LTV to CAC equation, and all of a sudden, you have lower customer acquisition cost, you have a slightly better margin, you have better retention, and you really drive that point home. And you can also recycle that cash many, many times over of what your competitors can, and then build out a strong balance sheet and get great talent on board. It all compounds over time. And you don't see that after one year or two years, but you really see it after five years or 10 years, then it's a massive, massive difference. It reminds me so much of a conversation I had with the founder of Carvana here in the US, where it's the same 100 different things have to be done well to add up to a great, simple customer experience at the end of the value chain. And it just sounds like process power, right? To use Hamilton Helmer's term, process power is what's driving HelloFresh's competitive advantage, which leads me to the question of how do you, as the leader of the business, manage a business which is dependent upon process power? So what do you do that you think is most important to make sure that you don't pull one muscle and interrupt the whole chain? What is it about leading an organization dependent on process power that you think matters? I think it all starts 
with introducing the right culture and introducing the right mechanisms into the business. So a business with 16,000 employees across 15 markets, it's obviously very, very hard to understand what everyone is doing and to even just be involved in the strategy of each subdomain of the business. But what we can do is basically create a culture that incentivizes behaviors that we think are wanted in the business and disincentivize behaviors that we think are actually diametrically opposite to what we actually want to do. And so I think right from the start, we've really tried to get into the organization that mindset of continuous improvement on getting that 1% better every week of not being happy and content with where we are with always re-asking, hey, we've been successful for the past year or two or three years with a certain organizational design. But is that really the same organizational design that will get us to the next level over the next 18 months? Or is there something that we proactively need to change? So something that change is always constant and that it's actually a reflection of progress in the business and that the faster you grow, the faster you need to change. Like all of these things and mindsets and culture values and core values, I think that is really important aside from being very, very data-driven and also making it very clear that we make decisions based on data, that we don't say data can answer everything for us, but that data can is usually the one thing that we use to inform decision-making. And that means in every single function, really having your success formula, understanding what is it that can make my function better by 1% next week? What is it where I want to be in 12 months, in 18 months, et cetera? And it's more about these things, mechanisms, to borrow the word from Amazon, that I think drive huge value and alignment at the same time, allowing autonomy. Can you give an example of a decision or a judgment? I'm thinking about this continual improvement that just gives us a window into that culture, something that you or someone on the team decided that was in service of this idea of one to two to 5% better. I'm just trying to get like an actual tactile example of it. So let's go back to menu planning. It's one of my favorite examples, menu planning, because from the outside, it's just always a lot of people assume how hard can it be to slip 30 meals on a menu? Isn't that something that everyone can do, every single grocery store, everyone else, etc.? So if we think about menu planning, we talk a lot about menu expansion. How can we get better in our manufacturing facilities so we can handle more complexity so we can in turn give more choice to our consumers. So we've been thinking a lot about how can we actually do that and how can we enable our menu planning team to actually put more meals on the menu. And then when it comes to that day and we are at 35 meals and we say, hey, we now can do an additional three meals or five meals. It's not about going from 35 to 50 or from 35 to 100. It's really about going from 35 to 38 to 40, et cetera. And so when we make that decision, we look a lot at the underlying data and actually say like, what are reasons that some customers have canceled in the past? What are some of the meal ratings that they gave us that they told us were not good enough, for example? What are some mega trends out there that we actually see? So for example, at the moment, vegan meals is something that has gained a lot in popularity over the last 18 months. As we think about what do we want to invest in and for an additional three meals into the menu, we really walk it down, talk to a lot of different stakeholders, gather a lot of numbers, and then do like big business cases around if we can drive down cancellation reasons for that by adding those three meals by 1%, that will actually translate into a financial impact of whatever it is, 5 million of EBITDA next year. If we instead were going for three other meals, that are not helping us to drive down cancellation rate, but actually help us to open up a totally new segment. How big is that segment? What will we be able, um, how many of those households of that segment will we be able to address in the next two years? And what is that business case actually? And so we're kind of like running a lot of numbers and going actually very deep, also looking at second order and third order effects, and then really try to come up with which three meals do we actually put into those slots? And if I say three meals, it's not a specific meal. It's like which type of meal, which framework is actually in there. And that's what then basically makes us go from 35 to 38. It's usually there's a lot of science behind that. 
obviously I'm sure COVID had an incredible positive, I'm sure it was hard, but I'm sure it had an incredibly positive impact on the business since more people were eating at home more. How do you think about the transition out of COVID and the impact that might have on your business? It's the obvious question, but it's a big one. What COVID meant for us is just that while consumers have been eating about 50% of their dinners at home, all of a sudden they were cooking and eating up to 90 or 100% of their meals at home. So obviously our opportunity set just got much, much bigger. There was a lot of spend that actually went from restaurant dining and from out of home dining to actually in home dining. This was certainly like a tailwind and the tailwind that also helped us um, propel the business forward quite significantly. Like I think early 2020, we were on track to grow the business 50% year over year, we then ended up growing about 120%. So there was definitely like a good tailwind that we actually saw. And now that a lot of the whole world has been opening up again, obviously still a lot of people working from home, but restaurants open and actually seeing like mobility stats going up, etc. We definitely see that the opportunity set for in-home meals is getting slightly reduced. But what we've also seen is that customers that got to know that they actually formed a habit of cooking at home during the pandemic. That they very often continued to use the service, maybe not five meals per week, but rather four meals or three meals per week. And that's okay for us because in the end, we want to build a business for the next 10 or 20 years. And if you order five meals next week or three meals, I don't really care. My customer lifetime value with you, if you're a happy customer, is going to be so high that we want to make it as easy as possible for you to really fit into your lifestyle and really be the service that you go to for all the meals you cook actually at home. For us, there's obviously like a transition period. I think we're going to be still growing very strongly this year, year over year. We've now seen in summer for the first time people taking holidays again. And typically in summer, people are spending a lot more time eating outside of their own four walls. But that's something that has come back again this year. But I think we're very confident about the future prospects of the business because we just see that the underlying order behavior of all of our mature customer base and also of the customer base that we acquired during COVID is just remarkable stable, an additional element of more people working from home, I think will actually continue to be positive for the business because in the end, what that means is that of 30 dinners and 30 lunches, rather than eating only 15 dinners at home, you're probably in the future eating 20 dinners at home and maybe another 10 lunches. And that just meant that our total addressable market as a consequence of people spending more time at home, even post pandemic, has just become significantly larger. Another business that comes to mind is Costco. And if you study its history through price, convenience, selection, you know, the things that I think drive consumer choices in this kind of business, as they get bigger and bigger, they become a bigger scale buyer with their suppliers. And famously, like they reach a point where I think with salmon and with chicken, they just said, look, suppliers can no longer deal with us in the way we want. We're going to build our own salmon or chicken farms or whatever. How do you think about that concept of as you become more and more successful with more and more scale, the options, both from a financial and a business model standpoint, to bleed into complements to your business, suppliers, distribution, like other areas, I'm sure will present themselves. Do you think you'll go that direction? The equivalent of like private label and grocery, when you have so much demand that you can start to eat into other aspects of the ecosystem? Everything in HelloFresh is private label. So 95 or 98% of what you'll find in your HelloFresh order is either perishables, which is unbranded, or it's actually HelloFresh brand. So we've already done that. I think that's really important for the customer experience and for the customer value proposition that it's actually like one brand that is being exposed to you. But to your broader question, it really depends on the time horizon. In the next five years, I definitely don't see us buying any salmon farms or cattle farms or doing anything like that. For that, just the growth momentum in the business, building out our own supply chain, the amount of customers that we can reach, the amount of food spent for each consumer that we can actually capture in addition to what we capture today through going into new verticals, through offering more items to actually buy together with our meals. I think those are such big opportunities that 
I don't think this is realistic in the next five years. I think, for example, that is more realistic is building out our own first party logistics and at some point in the future, opening that up to other people. And what we have seen is, um, I think as of today, we're doing roughly 25% of our global orders. We actually deliver ourselves with first party logistics. I can definitely see that going up in the future because generally what we tend to see is that you get a higher order frequency for those customers where you deliver with your own fleet. You have lower order rates. You can do it very cost efficient in high density areas. It's just something that takes a lot of time to build up. It's a lot of labor relations that you need to build. It's a lot of systems and technology that you need to build to actually be able to offer a world-class service. But this is something that I tend to find more realistic. But most of all, we think a lot of our secret sources within our manufacturing, within our advertising function, within our understanding of the consumer. And so I think you will see us go much more towards being more than a meal kit provider rather than integrating even deeper into our supply chain. What have you learned about messaging and advertising and brand? Do you do partnerships? It seems like a brand that generates a lot of customer love. I remember seeing in a private investor event, someone talking a lot about if you go on Reddit, there's just like a crazy amount of discussion of different meals and the customer seems very involved in the business and bought into it. So that means you've done something right in advertising or brand building. What are the major lessons there? Like what has worked so well? What's incredibly important for us is definitely word of mouth and both referral program that we have and how we incentivize that, as well as all of the word of mouth that happens offline, which you can't track. This is something that's just incredibly important. And if we actually ask consumers, how have you heard about us for the first time, then a really large number is actually telling us these days, my neighbor is using it, my colleague from work has been raving about it, all these things. So having a great reputation and actually incentivizing referral. And obviously our product, which is very emotional, gives you a sense of achievement if you've cooked a really great meal and the whole family has been happy. That is something that you like to talk about. I think this is definitely like one very, very big lesson for us that in advertising, if you have a customer base that raves about you, there's a lot of things that you can do to actually optimize that. But this is so incredibly important and then also spills over and makes all of the other things that you spend money on much more effective. So I was talking about the five to 10 touch points that a consumer usually needs. And very often it's your colleague from work telling you about the HelloFresh meal he cooked. You see a TV ad, you're getting retargeted from us on Facebook or on the Google Display Network. You then find a voucher in your mail and then you convert, and then it's in advertising all about how do you attribute the value of each of those touch points to the final conversion. I think one thing that you can barely overstate is really the value of word of mouth. That is something that really comes with having a great product and incentivizing people to really talk about it. If I was to draw on a napkin the growth equation for HelloFresh over the next five years, what do you think the major variables would be? Is it different geographies? Is it more meals ordered per week? Is it new customers just overall? Like, What do you think are the A, B, and C in that equation for HelloFresh's growth for the next five years? In the short term, a lot of the order rate of customers is driven by the menu that you have next week or whether they go on holidays or don't go on holidays, whether they like the meal next week or not. But in the long run, it's really what structurally changes your order rate is really basically either working on pricing, bringing pricing down, or working on your service levels or working on your assortment. And in the end, that's the typical Amazon playbook. You work on service levels, you work on assortment. Those are, in my view, the only three levers that really sustainably can change your curve, your retention curve, your order rate curve. And that's really what, in our view, in the medium run, will propel the business forward. If I look at our current penetration levels, then certainly I think for the different meal kit brands that we have, HelloFresh, Green Chef, Every Plate, Factor 75, there's a lot of upside in just basically getting new customers that have never tried it before to get them convert doing some of their dinners annually 
with us. So I think this is going to be like a major growth driver, just given where penetration rates are at the moment. Secondly, we've been very successful in scaling internationally. I think in the last couple of years, we've launched about one to two new geographies each year. I think that's a clip that we find very healthy. We have a very good playbook in place, very great teams that have launched operations in multiple geographies over the years. And so I think this is a very low risk, high probability bet that we'll continue making to make. That's really sort of like the second dimension of our growth. Then what we have started doing at some point last year, really based on customer feedback, that they want more convenient offerings. It's building out our product offering towards more convenience. And that's within the meal kit space, giving you more options around meals that only take 15 or 20 minutes to prepare. But then even going a step further and actually investing in our own ready-to-eat vertical. So we took over a company, great company out in Chicago, Factor 75, healthy, nutritious, high-quality, premium, ready meals, much better quality that you can get in a supermarket where all these meals need to have like 14 days shelf life or something. If you can optimize ready meals for three, five days shelf life, you can get a totally different quality. So really excited about that business, have already managed to scale that business quite significantly in the US, still huge off penetration runway, but we also want to take that business internationally. Right now it's only in the US. So this is certainly something that we're also quite excited about. And then finally, if you think about the 7 million households or the 20 million customers, unique customers that placed at least one order with us in the last quarter, even for the best of those customers, they're only spending about 12, 15% of their overall food budget on HelloFresh. So I think there are many, many opportunities to actually capture more of a consumer's food budget if we can actually deliver them great value. So we're thinking out about offerings for lunch, offerings for breakfast, for snack occasions, for those dinners that you might be cooking at home, but are not cooking a HelloFresh meal. How can we be helpful for those meals? So in the end, to me, there is still 85% of a consumer's food spend for good HelloFresh customers that is not going towards HelloFresh. So what are some of the things that we can offer to those consumers, provide them with great value that allows us to go from 15% of their food spend to actually capturing 20% of that food spend. That is a massive, massive opportunity. And that is something that we also have a really smart team working on here. We have piloted it in one market up to about 500 additional items, curated items that you can buy from us in one of our smaller European markets where we have piloted that. And hopefully we will also be rolling that out to all markets globally over the next couple of years. How do you think about these different brands? So like Factor 75 sounds fascinating. I can start answering my own question because that one specifically sounds appealing to me. You mentioned Green Chef, there's others. What drives the decisions to have a portfolio of brands, make acquisitions, build something, whatever, versus constantly reinvesting in the HelloFresh brand specifically? Like, what does it buy you? Because it seems like you're interrupting a compounding brand story by introducing new brands, but they obviously serve a purpose. So what's the thinking and the strategy around multiple brands? So the key insight that we had is that we want to make it easier for you to create really great meals from scratch at home, make it as convenient and make it affordable for you. But that key insight that applies to uh, the guy working in finance, making half a million per year and spending 2000 bucks per month on food. And it also applies to someone in a less advantageous neighborhood who also wants to get a great dinner on the table, but might be more budget constrained. And we felt like if we were to offer everything under the HelloFresh brand, it's really, really hard to communicate to all of the different customer segments that we actually want to appeal to. The decision that we've been making is actually to say like, hey, are there certain segments in the market where a different message actually resonates, where we can offer a product at a totally different price point? And so as of today, right, we're offering our Green Chef and Factor meals at a price point of about 10 to $12 per meal. A HelloFresh meal is about $8 per meal. And an every plate meal is around $5 per meal. So $5 is less than the median spent on a home cooked dinner for a household in the US, which means it's super accessible. It's super affordable. But the type of product that we offer there, like crowd pleasers, 
things like a simple burger, things like fish fingers, like a nice pasta, a lot of other things. Like that product is very distinct from a Green Chef product, which would have premium sort of like salmon, which would have highest grade broccoli, which would have organic meat, etc. And obviously, you cannot offer those very distinct products at the same price point and also communicate the benefits of those products in a very targeted way to your different customer segments that you want to reach. So the way that we chose to do is that we integrate them a lot on the back end. So they're running on the same technology platform across our supply chain. But the brand, the product, the menu, the culinary items, those are very separate because we're reaching out to very different customer segments. And we think doing that all under one brand would just dilute the message too much and you're everything to everyone, but at the same time, not really anything to anyone. Fascinating. It makes complete sense. It leads me to a couple of closing questions. The first of which is risks to the business. So luckily, most of this conversation's been up and to the right type stuff. You've been very, very successful, done extremely well in the process power stuff that we've talked about. The numbers speak for themselves. But if we were to imagine the opposite, that in five years, for some reason, HelloFresh has stagnated or gone the wrong direction, what do you think the biggest reasons for that might be? How do you think about the biggest risks that face the business? The biggest risk is really that it's a complex business model. And like we talked before, you're really good in a lot of different areas of the business. And if you're just failing in one area of the business, then business as a whole just has a hard time getting anywhere. So I think that's the overarching risk where we need to make sure that we build great technology that empowers all functions to automate decision-making, to make better decisions, to actually better serve customers and always improve our value proposition to customers. Because I think... Uh, Jeff Bezos said it, like customers are never happy. Customer expectations are always increasing. I definitely also see that with our business. So 10 years ago, just the facts that we were delivering to your doorstep, that we were giving you everything in the right amounts to cook a meal from scratch, that was something that customers raved about. That is not something that customers are happy today. Today, it needs to be a certain diet. It needs to be a certain lifestyle. It needs to be delivered in a very tight time window very high quality acquired in each step of your processes and customer expectations, consumer expectations are just always on the rise and you can never fulfill them and you can never satisfy them, which is great because it also means that you always need to innovate just to keep up. But I think this is the biggest risk that we cannot develop the business as fast as we want and we cannot keep up with consumer expectations because we're falling behind in one area of the business. I see that as the biggest risk long-term. We're obviously doing a lot and I'm fighting a lot internally in hiring the right people, building the right technology, having the right warning systems in place, introducing the right culture and influence over the company, having a clear vision of the type of company and DNA that we want to have here. But this still, I think, is the biggest risk on a long enough time horizon. It's very fun to imagine the seven or 800 million meals that you've delivered in these different geographies throughout a given year. It's kind of a cool thing to imagine, like from the suppliers all the way through to the person eating all this coordination with very low waste. The, you know, the 1% waste thing is kind of an amazing statistic. My fun closing question for you is, what is your favorite meal? Is there one that you from HelloFresh personally have eaten the most or enjoy the most or means something special to you? This is probably a little bit embarrassing, but I've grown up in Munich, Bavaria. Bavaria is very different from Berlin, very different where I'm now located for most of my time, very different from New York, a lot of other places, very explicit cuisine, Bavarian meatballs. That's actually something that is my favorite meal. I eat every time I go home and visit my parents, which have actually also made it to the German menu. Not exactly the recipe of my mother, but a slightly improved version. You can sometimes see me going down to the German team and actually telling them, hey, when can we have the meatballs back on the menu? Dying to get them to get a taste of home. I love it, Dominic. This has been so much fun. What an interesting, and as you say, complex business. It's been a ton of fun breaking it down with you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Patrick. To find more episodes of Breakdowns ranging from Costco to Visa to Moderna, or to sign up for our weekly summary, check out joincolossus.com. That's J-O-I-N-C-O-L-O-S-S-U-S dot com. 